What's up everybody? This is Tom once again with Deep Video Live on location here at Cheap Steaks in Deep Ellum, Dallas, Texas. We've got to keep this short and sweet, but we're joined by a very special guest today, Mr. Kyle Rasmussen of one of my favorite modern death metal bands, Vitriol, sir. Thanks for taking the time. I know it's been a little crazy today. It has. Thank you very much for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, man. So let's get right into this. This is the, this is the meat and potatoes of it. The question I think that's kind of on everybody's minds with the release of Suffer and Become, I, I kind of wanted to interrogate what you think the philosophy of suffering is, because some people, some people just think of it as pain, but there's, it's an overarching thing. And uh, so, what does it mean to you, and what is its inherent value? I think that, I mean, I've, man, that's a huge question. I'm going to do my best to answer it in a Please. concise way. I think, at the risk of sounding too. I don't know, mystical or pretentious. I think that the world is run on what I call divine contradictions. Things that don't really make the same, excuse me, uh, aspects of the world that seem very counterintuitive. And I think anyone who engages in voluntary suffering, self-made adversity, uh, they, ultimately achieve the wisdom that that is where heaven's on the other side of that so to speak you know what i mean like yeah. paradise is on the other side of that so like is it more like like the kingdom of heaven is within or like like just suffering and discomfort is like the path forward to a yeah. sense of improvement yeah i mean i think that and I want to be, I probably shouldn't have used the term heaven. I just mean more in generally like a, We're in Texas. A, a place, you know, where you can feel spiritually at ease, you know what I mean? Where you feel like a sense of purpose and that you've kind of reunited with yourself. I think you can only do that through the crucible of suffering. Uh, I think it's like our culture is awakening to that in a way, even small instances like the popularity of ice baths. Yeah. Right? People are really starting to figure out this kind of transmutive relationship between pursuing pain and feeling pleasure. Mm -hmm. And when we pursue pleasure, we often careen into depression and pay. I mean, you think about the people that sit at home and play video games and jerk off all day. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, but I feel you. You know what I mean? It's like, it's not really food for the soul. You know what yeah. I mean? Uh, you get very, and, and it's easy to, to not awaken to that because I think we live in a culture that really depends on us believing that joy and comfort is the purpose of life. It, it encourages it. It encourages it because it, it, yeah. it makes you a, a really reliable consumer, right? Because if, you, if you're convinced that the meaning of life is just to eliminate as much discomfort as possible and pursue the new shiny thing or the next vacation, you're a very reliable customer. Mm -hmm. And that's what people want. They want to convince you that life is about joy and that they can give you that joy for the right price. But, so, but it can be, you can cultivate it yourself if you have a little bit of, a little bit of discipline and like big picture. Yeah, and you just don't get it from trying to feel, you know, if you're feeling shitty, it feels instinctively natural to try to put that at ease by doing drugs or not that I am against that I there are some substances I partake in but there aren't ones where uh, I never want to have a compulsive or reliant relate dependent relationship on anything that I partake in do you think you might have an addictive personality or do you oh. just uh... yeah I mean I, I'm obsessive and I think that like when I fall in love with something I fall in love with it very hard and uh, I spent three months in the hospital in 2018 and had a whirlwind romance with opiates uh, that lasted several months. And, you know, poor went out for marijuana. Thanks for saving me. Uh, I was able to kick it with that and uh, eventually weaned off of that from being a habitual addiction to just kind of finding a space for it in my life where it's I can enjoy it every once in a while. and laugh and be easy and at ease and take a little break from my my sense of endless like ambition and drive that kind of is exhausting it sounds like you know there's a time and a place for everything and if you can find that and again have a little bit of discipline and uh just just stay focused with it and remind yourself of the harm it did before 
it sounds yeah. like you can achieve a good, pretty good balance. Absolutely. And I actually think experiencing addiction, like I, I'm not saying this to be, I'm, I'm really sincere when I say that I'm grateful for my opiate addiction. I'm grateful for it because there's really, in, in my life experience, there's been nothing more humbling than being addicted to drugs. You feel about that fucking big. And you don't, I don't think you have the imagination for the helplessness and the kind of self-enslavement that you experience from addiction. And experiencing such a beautiful, I mean, cause I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be that guy that lies about drugs aren't that, of course they're that good. Of course drugs are great. That's why people get addicted. That's why people throw yeah, their lives you, away from you them. do it and you just immediately feel great about oh everything. Oh my God. I mean, I was like the first time I took opiates, uh, I was like, oh, this is what, like, this is what uh, people who aren't miserable all the time must feel like. I was like, oh my God. It's like the skies parted and it felt like a, a big warm hug, you know? So when I had the opportunity, the decision, when that addiction became too severe, that I had to choose my vitality and my dream, especially with the band. I mean, that was a big thing that pulled me out of it. Um, or that kind of bliss. Being, you, you tell, your something, tell yourself something very powerful when you choose yourself over bliss. You know what I mean? Like yeah, when absolutely. you choose your health and your presence of mind over that feeling, it actually instills in you this tremendous confidence. So uh, how would you say delayed gratification uh, sinks into that? Because that's that's what I think of when I say, quote unquote, big picture. There's, and it also ties into the temporary suffering. Like it, you're not gonna be able to achieve, you're not gonna be able to better yourself unless you go through that experience, yeah. see, what it, uh, see how it feels and just live through getting past it so live the only way out is keeping that, so keeping that in mind yeah it, would you say delayed gratification plays into it yeah absolutely i definitely think delayed gratification plays into it um and that's the how oh, what am i trying to say i think the delayed gratification is more of a byproduct of uh, okay yeah, yeah. of the greater why you know what I mean? Fuck, I don't know. I have a hard time uh, articulating these things no, sometimes. That's actually a pretty good phrase, the greater why. Like, yeah. that's, that's nice and succinct. I like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like, for me, the experience of making better decisions for myself feels like a progressive zooming out of like the consciousness or perspective. You know what I mean? It's like, you, when you're young, you're very granular, you're very selfish, the world is very small, it yeah. revolves around you. And as you age, some people hold on to that juvenile selfish, selfishness and other people start seeing opportunities to, I guess, take on more responsibility. They see the, gr they see the greater world and start to gain a uh, sense of perspective, it yeah. sounds like. And I think really the only way to achieve that perspective and get to those higher levels of consciousness is through suffering. I believe a big reason why vitriol is the band name even is the vitriol is on a surface level it's very vicious anger very aggressive yes. like like to the t aggressive yes. the antiquated definition of vitriol vitriol was a term in ancient alchemy for sulfuric acid it was called the green lion and the reason why it was called the green lion is because well it was green the substance and uh, it destroyed everything that wasn't a pure and precious metal. So they used it to erode away impurities from gold and whatnot, right? Yeah, so vitriolic is like a scientific term for a process. For exactly. Uh, well, more or less. So it, it refers to, in that, in that context, a scientific uh, refinement through destruction. There it is. You know? So it's, it's, I think a lot of people make what I consider to be a, a wrong headed, makes sense, but uh, people think doing the right thing is about sitting back, analyzing, determining the right thing, and then moving toward the right thing. I think that's seldom 
works because we don't we aren't as wise as we think we are we often don't really know what we need or want and you find out what you need or want by going out and getting things that you don't want and saying oh that's not it oh that person's not it oh that job's not it you know yeah it's that old that's the uh, not an adage but you know it, uh, I've, I've seen the saying go around before that's like there is no failure that you just learned what doesn't work exactly and I, I, if you can the furthest you can take that concept the more you're willing to joyfully participate in the chaos of life, the more you will discover about yourself, the more wisdom you will acquire, the more, in my opinion, the more you appreciate the things you're unable to appreciate with, when you're lacking that adversity. Absolutely. It provides you with the perspective to where you can go home from the trench or whatever and be like, and fall into the, to the bosom of your house life, your home life or whatever, because you finally have that, that balance. And I think in, in a society that really, again, devalues discomfort, devalues, um, I think discomfort almost, really sums it up. Yeah. I think we almost pathologize it. Like it's like it's self kind of, like it's a masochism or something. And it's, if you're do like I said earlier, it's far more about the why than the, than the what, right? So if you're, mindful about that of course you can go out and just fuck yourself up and if you're doing it for the wrong reasons Easily. but uh if you're actually going out there truth seeking the best thing you can do to achieve truth is to destroy every destructible falsehood you know what i mean so all that's left speaking of <laughs> suffering yeah. all that will be left in the wake of dispelling all of those untruths will be what is real and I think a lot of people try to pursue what's real, like I said, by finding it in the, in the needle in the haystack and just pulling the needle out because we're too afraid of digging in the hay. You gotta dig in the fucking hay. Yeah, gotta get there's your hands There's no way, you know, there's no way you're gonna find that needle unless you're fucking in there. And you're, you're most likely to find that needle if you dive in head first and wait for it to stab into your body. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, absolutely. So you can, that's a relationship with life that you can choose to have. And, uh, and you don't have to start big. Go to the gym, yeah. you know what I mean? I think that's a great way to, even if you don't really care about personal fitness, it's, the gym is far more about the mind than it, the body. It instills discipline, oh for sure. God. Yeah, and it teaches you, I've discovered that the gym really is a great metaphor. How your body grows in the gym is a perfect metaphor for how your mind grows in the gym of the greater world, you know what I mean? So it happens slowly, yeah, yeah. we want things to happen quick, and uh, you go to the gym and you're immediately deflated by how long it takes to get any kind of progress. It's, it's pretty hard when you're first starting out if you're not used to that sort of exactly. shit. Exactly. The in, kind of the initiation process, the the being weak at the gym, seeing everyone else strong around you, the 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 triumph of will it takes to work through that shame or laziness or whatever it might be. Um, you learn so much by just getting to that point it becomes it starts clearing up internal struggles you're like oh this isn't supposed to happen overnight you don't change your perspective by just watch reading the right book or watching the right movie it's just you step one foot after the other exactly. and if you went far down a road it's going to take you that much longer to go back down the other side you know it's it's anyway i'm ranting no, no, we love it. And thank you very much for the insight. I appreciate it. And uh, got one more question because things are going to be getting going here pretty soon. But that, uh, you touched on it earlier and I wanted to dig into it a little more. How do you see Vitriol as a band, like musically? How does that, uh, is, is that like your translation of this, like giving it material form? How, do, how does this wall of noise that you've made, you've somehow made sound beautiful, how does that, uh, where does that come from and how does that tie into the whole concept of suffering? that whole diatribe that we just went on what you yeah on. yeah well great question these are both excellent questions so thank you very much thank you um, I do a lot of work to make sure that the music reflects the philosophy and the ideology of the band so we have a rule in vitriol that I that I don't have to impose because everyone's into it fortunately but I say we have a 95% rule uh, and that means if you are ever executing your parts live better than 95% you need to try harder. Because if you're getting it at 98% or 
you're too you're not chasing it hard enough it it's not like out of reach there enough. might be like something in your head too like something's just you're, you're you're distracted while you're on stage even if it's just minute yeah so what i want is i actually want the guys and myself i never want to play a perfect show because if i nail every single thing then I know I've got the carrot in my mouth. And I don't want the carrot in my mouth. I want it hanging right in front of my nose, right? Yeah. I don't want to chase that carrot aggressively and never catch it because that being on that burning edge of just just playing just outside of your ability, um, that is that violent refinement. You know what I mean? That's like... If that's it, not a song title, it should be. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> that is, you know, for me... Being able to get up on stage and risk fucking up a solo, that's a kind of, that's a kind of like rewarding sacrifice, you know, because it's like people that are unwilling to embarrass themselves don't grow as quickly because you're always playing in that 100%. You know, you're always like making sure it's slow enough that you can nail it perfectly. Fuck nailing it perfectly, man. And nobody wants to see people up, at least metal, in my opinion. I don't want to say nobody, some people. But pe with my relationship with metal, I don't want to see someone up there just going through a rehearsal. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I want to see someone getting fucking after it. There, there's, a, there, there's, a whole different, um, there's a whole different dynamic with that because, you know, when you're talking about perfection, if you're ever going to chase that, which you, arguably you should or shouldn't, Perfection is for the studio. Like when you're presenting the most polished, pristine version of your product that you can, that you can market out to everybody. But a live setting is something completely different. Like yeah, you want to you want to play the songs. You don't want to completely fuck it up. But you're, people are paying for this. There's a nice crowd gathering here already. These people paid money for an experience, not just to fucking yeah, not just exactly. to watch you. Exactly like you said, not just to stand there and play their parts and be like, yeah. thanks. Yeah, cool, great, clean scales, bro. Moving on, buying. You know, it's. I think metal has, is such a musically impressive genre that it's very easy for the kind of the sonic element of metal to steal the show. And I think it's also it's such a hyper-masculinized, it makes sense, uh, culture and genre that uh, we have this nasty little habit of trying to keep it a secret that we have feelings about stuff. Yeah. Oh, God forbid. Yeah, right, I don't right. Therapy. Yeah. So... For me, trying to keep that, for me, art is always, vitriol is just about communicating what's in here and what's in here for me. So the music is a vessel. We're intense and technical, not because we want a showboat, but because to me, that's, that's the kind of sonic manifestation of that relentless pursuit of like, that's perfect growth and furthering yourself and like, and it, to be clear, I am trying to be perfect, but I want to make sure that perfection is always out of reach. Yeah. I want to push that little that always, little bait. Always chasing, never catching. Always chasing, never catching. Well, that's a great way of putting and I, it. And I, th I would love to continue.